I don't really think I need to introduce Seth. In this neighborhood, he's well known. Um, he's the founder of uh, Tofurky. Um, I, I love the picture that he uh, posted about his new book, uh, In Search of the Wild Tofurky. Um, and I like what it says below it, how a business misfit pioneered plant-based foods before they were cool. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm sure he'll mention that also. Um, the, the title is New Insights and Trends in Plant-Based Foods 2021. By the way, I also saw that he has a uh, history of uh, plant-based foods that goes back to the 1700s. So we're thinking of trying to uh, schedule one of those in the future and, and uh, learn about that history. Uh, anyway, he's gonna present a lively interactive show to examine current areas of growth and what this forecast for the future of plant-based foods. Um, he's going to talk about some of the advancements in USA, but also vegan hotspots uh, emerging in some of the most really unlikely places in the country, in the world. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Seth and uh, thank you very much for presenting this evening. Well, thank you, John. <clears throat> and thank you, everybody. Uh, for coming. It's uh, always a pleasure to um, speak with you. I've had a long history with Northwest Veg now and really appreciate all you do for vegetarian and vegan eating in the Portland metro area and especially that tofurkey trot that Jacqueline has been uh, organizing so well for so many years. So we love what you do and your mission and it's just an honor to be here. So I put together what I'm calling now a report from the front lines 2020, and we're going to look at some of the behind the scenes stories and trends that um, kind of are that most people don't get to see because this is really our livelihood. This is what we do out there at Tofurky. We look for trends and stories. And um, like John said, I'm going to be giving away a copy of my book, uh, In Search of the Wild Tofurky, which came out in 2020, one of the good things to come out of 2020, hopefully. And um, yeah, just use your chat buttons, but also uh, to answer those questions. But if you have questions that come up, um, put them in the Q&A tab or the chat, I guess. Uh, right, John? Yeah. Like, and then we'll, I'll, I'll just stay around afterwards and we can all unmute and just have a free for all. Uh, talk because I love uh, hearing what you guys have to say. So here's some of the stories and I'm going to start off with a, a little known story that just happened last week and I don't know if you guys missed it or not but you know when Biden became president he had this great big pile of uh, you know executive orders that he signed and and this was one of them. This is a new executive order that on the first day of office, he made sriracha and nutritional yeast mandatory at all vegan meals for vegans. So make sure you get the nutritional yeast and sriracha in there. And I know that's not a problem because you love both of those as a vegan, you have them all the time. And, you know, if you love nutritional yeast, like I do, I just have it on everything. Uh, and this was what I got from Santa this year. I got this I Heart Nutritional Yeast t-shirt that is really cool. And I mean, I think that I got a second or something because I really didn't finish it, but I fixed it and put it up there. You know, somebody told me there was some crazy city where they were selling these on the street corner, but I can't believe that. It's probably fake news. But I love me nutritional yeast. And uh, I just wanted to start out, you know, um, looking at where we are. Um, on, on a reality check, um, just a couple of slides, just to remind ourselves of wh where we find ourselves in 2021. And right now we have 36% of all mammals on earth are humans. And there are 7 billion of us now, and there'll be 10 billion by 2050. 60% of mammals are captive awaiting slaughter for us to eat which leaves only 4% of mammals that live in the wild. 
that's a really small number. So we're really dominating, um, you know, what the ecosystem can support. And 70% of all birds on earth are actually caged poultry now. And every single ecosystem, major ecosystem on the planet is in decline, you know, and especially of concern is the lungs of the planet down there in the Amazon. And in the one or two minutes that I've been talking, there has been a football sized area of the Amazon cleared for every minute that is in the day. So we are in a very um, hard place right now. So the problem becomes on the big level, and we're looking big level now, we'll get into small level uh, later. The problem is uh, how do we feed 10 billion people? Because that's gonna need 56% more food. And how can we create this food without using more land? Because right now we're using so much of the earth, 50% of the earth for agriculture. And we need to save an area of forest about the size of two Indias because forests are uh, a big part of our survival because of the carbon sinks that they provide for us. And at the same time that we're growing all this food without using more land, if that wasn't enough, we still have to lower our emissions by 67% of greenhouse gases. So how are we gonna do that? Well. I have a solution, which are plant proteins and plant-based diets are way more efficient and they decrease greenhouse gases. <clears throat> Two football field, like for one person to live on a standard American meat-centric diet, is they need two football fields of space. But two football fields of space that are used to grow plant-based proteins and vegetables will support 14 people. And this is what Francis Moore LaPay pointed out to me in Diet for a Small Planet when I read it in 1971. And I was like, this is so smart. We've got to do this. And that's where I became a vegetarian and later a vegan. Um, and then not only that, if everyone in the world ate a plant-based diet, there'd be five billion football fields worth of land that could be returned to forest. That is huge when you think of the wildlife and how we've only got 4% mammals and that they're decreasing in numbers all the time because we're stealing their habitat. So 30% of the world's lands right now are used for livestock and only 40% are um, the US lands are used for growing animals uh, protein. But as you can see over here, the demand side mitigation of a vegan diet is huge. Like compared to all these other diets, it will reduce um, our greenhouse gases. And if the US grains and beans alone that are now fed to animals could be fed directly to people, 800 million more people could be fed. That's roughly a third of the more people that'll uh, be traveling with us on this planet by 2050. So big efficiency jump there. And not only that, <clears throat> a plant-based diet would reduce the amount of land needed for agriculture by 76% and would cut greenhouse gases by 50%. We said, which only leaves 17% more greenhouse gases that have to be cut in order to meet that 67%. So plant-based diets, they are what we need. All right, um, so let's take a look back at that dumpster fire of 2020 that we all just lived through. And uh, it was a tough year for all of us and it was a tough year at Tofurky, but uh, we kept everybody safe and happy and tried to make as many adjustments as we could to our plant and to integrate people's schedules because people really have a lot on their plate now. You know, schools aren't open in Hood River where the Tofurky plant is now. So we have to uh, make accommodations for a lot of our employees and bend over backwards to make sure that the family comes first. So it's been a challenging year, but let's take a look at it. In um, 
the spring of 2020, these this great group called the Vegetarian Resource Group in Baltimore uh, does a Harris poll and they want to find out how many vegans, how many vegetarians, how many flexitarians. They have all different classes there are in the United States. And so right now, uh, this year, they came up with 3% of us are vegans, 3% of us are vegetarians, and 36% of us are flexitarians, which means they eat both animal-based proteins and plant-based proteins, which leaves about 58% of the American public uh, is unconverted. But this section of the pie is over 100 million people that uh, are now either reducing or eliminating their uh, meat intake of animals. So great news there. Uh, if you dig into this deeper, you will find in the demographic that 8% of African Americans are vegan, only 3% of America as a whole, but 8% of African Americans are vegan. That's more than double the percentage of any major demographic group in the US, big number. I also have been doing this readings, as John was saying, on history, and I found this poll from 1943 that said 2% of uh, Americans were vegetarians or vegans. Actually, the word vegetarian was the only word then. The word vegan wasn't invented until 1945, two years later. So in 1943, <clears throat> there were 2.7 million vegetarians and vegans in America. Uh, which had a population of about 139 million at that point. And in 2020, there are 19.4 vegetarian uh, million vegetarians and vegans, or about 6%. It doesn't sound like a lot of growth, but when you look at it population-wise, the U.S. population from 1943 to today has grown 2.4 times. And in the, since 1943, the um, number of vegetarians and vegans on the planet, on our country, has grown seven times. So, vegetarian and veganism is growing about three times as fast as the population growth of America. <clears throat> okay, so let's break down more. These are the main classes of plant based foods. The biggest class by far and the most successful part of plant-based foods is milk. Plant-based milks are great. Um, and as you can see here, I'm looking at two things. One is the growth of plant-based um, items. And then the orange is growth of animal-based items. So you can see milk, there's barely anything. It's, it's like completely flat in growth. There's no more... There's no growth in animal-based milk. In fact, it's declining and has been declining uh, a little bit for years. Meat, on the other hand, plant-based meats soaring, animal-based meats up a little bit. Uh, yogurt, again, you can see yogurt, creamer, cheese, butter, ice cream, all of the plant-based items are outgrowing the animal-based items. But um, you do see that creamer and meat and butter, these real fatty things are what's growing. But if you look at it further, 14% of all the milk sold in the USA in the supermarkets was plant-based in 2020. That's a huge number. Um, and, you know, there are uh, items like Oatly. I love Oatly. I love this phrase. It's like milk made for humans. But uh, milk is the shining star because, um, and it's way less uh, plant-based meats, which we'll see in our next slide. And this is an interesting thing. Today in um, Europe, there was this meeting, there's this amendment that's been passed and there's a meeting now to finalize it or reject it. And it's amendment number 171 and it's um, about milk. They're afraid, this is like they're trying to protect dairy. And it's not just like in this country, you know, you have names like you can't call it milk or you can call it milk. They're taking it a step further. Like here's yogurt. They're really focusing on milk and yogurt and not just the names, but the packaging. Like they're saying, that consumers are confused by this package, by this package. Like, 
reading this, who could discern that this was made from oats and not from milk? So they're saying, yogurt people, you can't package your goods like uh, other, like animal-based yogurt. And they're doing the same thing for milk cartons. Like here's your basic milk carton, right? But what they're saying is, this is confusing. This is an actual product, by the way. It's uh, sold in the United Kingdom, and it's called Not Milk, and it has a line, a cow through, yeah, a line through the cow, and it says plant-based. I don't know how much more, uh, you know, certain you need to be in your advertising of what this is, but you can see, like Oatly would be the same thing. Like this is confusing to people, and um, I'm telling you what. If this is confusing to people, I wonder if people are going to the store and they're buying this by mistake. They think they're buying milk. It's in the same carton. Are they saying that people can differentiate between orange juice and uh, cow milk, but plant-based milk is too crazy? So this is a real uh, serious problem and it has ramifications all across Europe. And I can't wait to see what they decided to do because it's actually today. Okay, look at uh, refrigerated meat alternatives, which is what Tofurky sells in as a class. Uh, we sell in refrigerated meat alternatives of all food in U.S. supermarkets. And, you know, it's not just Tofurky. We're talking about Beyond Meat here. We're talking about tempeh from Light Life. We're talking about field roast sausage. And we have two lines of growth here. The or orange line that you see at the bottom is all food in the supermarket. That's like potato chips and candy and vegetables and meat and everything. And you can see that that has been growing at about two or three percent. If they get two or three percent of growth, they're like breaking out the champagne and saying we had a successful year. Well, in 2020, when more people were not going out to eat and they were cooking at home more look at that they had a great year so it went up to 10 percent growth in the supermarkets of all food but look at this line this is what we call a hockey stick growth because it looks like a hockey stick and you can see that starting in 2017 an already uh, good category that was growing at uh, an average of about five percent so about twice what all food grows at suddenly went up to 15 percent 2018, 40%, 19, 50%. I just got this in, and as of December 31, 2020, the growth of refrigerated plant based meat alternatives in the supermarkets was 88% over last year. So that's an incredible number of, uh, you know, that growth, you just don't see that kind of sustained growth like that. And so the supermarkets, are just trying to get more and more plant-based items in. So that's a really good thing. And, you know, we love Beyond Meat. We love Light Life. We love, these aren't competitors. We want all vegan um, products to succeed because we have a lot of work to do. This is only 1% of all of the, the protein market. Meat outsells plant-based meats, even with this growth. $99 to one. So we have a $1 market share out of 100 and they have 99. So we have a lot to go and we need all these brands to succeed. And not only that, but US per capita meat consumption of animals in 2020 was 220 pounds a year. And thank you all you vegans like me, I'm a vegan. So I'm looking at this and going 220 pounds a year. That means somebody out there is eating 440 pounds of meat a year, right? So um, the point is, this is a very high, meat consumption is still high and we're growing and we're gonna sooner or later overtake it. Okay, get your chat button out. Everybody find your chat button. It's time to play Jeopardy. Uh, I'm gonna give you just a second to do this. You can see, uh, this is kind of a clue about what we're going to do. Um, and John, are you are you with me? Are you going to be able to read out these answers when people fire them in? Sure can. I'm ready. 
Okay. I hope everybody else is ready and they have found their chat. If you haven't found the chat button, I suppose you could unmute and just yell it out too, but uh, let's try and do this in chat because that gives us a thing. So here's your Jeopardy answer. Make sure you're, uh, <laughs> it's in this form of a question. Eh, you don't really need to, but uh, I just want to know it, who knows this. Here's the Jeopardy answer for one free Tofurky coupon. Original name of Whole Foods Market. Who knows the original name of Whole Foods Market? Whole Foods Market was started, by the way, the same year, 1980, that I started making tempeh in Forest Grove. Huh. Okay, we have one answer. It says Wild Oats. Uh, good wrong answer. I remember Wild Oats. They were a competitor of Whole Foods, and Whole Foods did buy them out. But it wasn't wild oats. It was there was something else. This was John Mackey. Oh. Anybody else? Well, yeah, I'm not getting any. Oop. Nature's fresh. That's uh, a good guess too. That was in Portland, of course it was, and Sprouts is another one. It's, oh, Safer Way, Mary Ann, you've got it. Mary Ann, um, congratulations. Uh, you can send me uh, an email to seth at tofurky.com, it's real easy and give me your um, address. And uh, yeah, it's just Seth at Tofurky.com. And I will send you uh, a free VIP coupon. Yeah, this is the Safer Way crew. Look at that. Look at all those hippies. <laughs> That was 1980, and that was in uh, Austin, Texas. All right, good job, Marianne. Good job, everybody. We'll have some others. So, you know, everybody asked this, like uh, I was on a panel today and they were asking, how did COVID-19 affect your business? Well, we had a very good year and, you know, we grew over 20%, which is really good for a, a older mature company like Tofurky that's been in business for 41 years. But, um, you know, these guys, DoorDash and Grubhub really uh, went wild too. So they've been doing a, a couple of studies on DoorDash and Grubhub, and this is what they found. They found that vegan burgers were up 433% over last year. People really are starting to connect, you know, this pandemic to diet. They also found that 70% of customers spent more time cooking. Huh, no kidding. You know, who's going out to eat? And 20% of customers were seriously considering vegan diets. That's a really uh, astounding number as well, because, you know, right now we're at uh, three percent, and if we got twenty percent, if they all came through with that promise, that would be a game changer. Um, <clears throat> and then overall, plant-based orders at DoorDash and Grubhub were up one hundred and thirty-five percent. So, um, you know, the COVID really is having an effect, and it's bringing more people into the plant-based space. Um, like even my brother, who was more of a flexitarian, but vegetarian-ish, you know, he's just been sounding like a activist to me. And, you know, even people like MSNBC Kramer, the guy that does the stock market, he's sounding like an animal rights activist to me. Like they're just, you know, saying this is such a terrible time. We can't repeat this. We've got to do whatever we can do to prevent this from happening again. So people are drawing the connections. Another measure that people use to see how are different trends growing and how do you measure trends is with Google searches. 
and searches for vegan on Google were up 47% worldwide. That's like five times the amount that it was up uh, five years ago. So we're really seeing some incredible movement there on Google searches. And the countries in the world that are the biggest ones for searches that, that have the most searches for vegan, the number three country in the world is Israel. The number two country in the world, Australia, they're searching for vegan. And the number one country in the world, drum roll please, the United Kingdom. And a lot of that is, I think, Veganuary is doing, which we're going to talk about in a minute, too. So those are the top three countries for vegan searches. Now, uh, I'm going to show you the top three cities in the world for vegan searches. Number three, I wonder if anybody knows where that is. So you can unmute your mic if you know what city this is. Any guesses? I'll, I'll, I'll put up a Tofurky coupon for this. You can send it in chat or you can send it in things. Any guesses coming in? This is known for its castle. There's a big castle in the center of town. We got one suggestion, Berlin. Good guess, nope. And Well, we've got two more. One is Prague. Another nope. Is Edinburgh. Edinburgh, you got it. Who is that? Well, there's two people who put it in. Barbara and Gail and Mike. I'll give them both coupons. Send me your info and you get your coupons. Good job. <clears throat> Everybody will know this city, the next one. Portland. <laughs> with voodoo donuts and the number one city in the world for the most vegan searches you would never guess this i would never guess this um this beautiful city in um western england called bristol and they have this incredible veg fest out there that's one of the biggest it's almost as big as the london veg fest which i've been to several times and uh Bristol is a sort of a hotbed of veganism in the UK. So it's really Bristol, Portland, and Edinburgh have the most uh, searches for the word vegan on Google in 2020. All right. Here's another headline. The first cellular meat was served in restaurant called Restaurant 1880 in Singapore. And that was served on December 18th, 2020. You know the Just Mayo people? Well, they uh, pivoted and they made this chicken. And so cellular-based meats are now making an appearance. This was a really high-end gourmet restaurant. And it was like chicken in a bao bun and wrapped in phyllo dough. And I mean, it was really high end. You can see it was just a little piece. That was like 23 bucks right there. But it's really, I think, good to see cellular meat. I'm all for it, you know, because not that it's for me. I'm happy eating, you know, tofurkey and Beyond Burgers and salads and just plants. But there's that unconverted you know, amount of people, I was like 56% or something of America that is still eating meat. I'd much rather have them do this. And it's better for the planet, better for their health, you know, better for the animals. And, uh, you know, I think that's an important thing. And people ask me, they go, well, are people going to buy meat that's made in a lab? And I'm going, are you kidding me? They buy in the most disgusting, despotic way of ever making food and they're, you know, you could even dream of now and they're eating that. I mean, are they going to want E. coli put in their meat from the lab or what? So I think it'll be a success. And it's also very efficient. Like, you know, this is a callous statement, but it takes six weeks to raise a chicken to slaughter weight and six days to grow clean meat chicken. Um, so once again, 
if you know you're you were not talking about animal welfare but just on the pure efficiency uh scale this is a much more efficient way of growing uh, meat okay here's some other news now we're getting into the tofurkey part of this session we have uh sued another state we ha we're kind of on track to so the last three years, we've sued three states. We sued Missouri two years ago. Last uh, one year ago, we sold, uh, we sued um, Arkansas, and then we sold Louisiana. And you know, this is just a labeling issue. Once again, it's a solution looking for a problem. There's no confusion between this burger and that burger. And please, like. These people, they're getting confused. They seem to be aware of what a chicken burger is, that it's not a hamburger, but a veggie burger is too far from them. I mean, it's just really crazy. And judges have, we're working with the ACLU and the Animal Legal Defense Fund and every case that we've brought forward, the judges have gone, this is right, this is right. They've been siding with us. so. Um, I don't know that this is going to be lasting, and this is a kind of a desperate plea, you know, from the meat industry that is seeing the handwriting on the wall. So um, we hope for success in Louisiana. Okay, here's another headline: Tofurkey introduces three new vegan cheeses. You know, people think of us as meat. But these are tapioca, coconut oil, uh, faba bean, and potato starch cheeses. We've been working on these for about five years, and a lot of the cheeses that are out there now have uh, the the formulas have been around in a while. You know, the vegan cheese market is very young. Like the first vegan cheeses I ever saw were the ones like tofu rella. Maybe some of you remember that and. There were soya costs and I uh, saw them. They were in the shelves about 1991 or two. And, you know, they they were a good first attempt, but they really didn't melt so well. You know, we used to have the old joke, which was, did you ever hear about the fire in the vegan cheese factory? Cheese still didn't melt. It was perfect the next day, you know, it was ha ha. But these are melting cheeses and they have a great flavor. We got cheddar, mozzarella, and a fiesta blend of three cheeses uh, Monterey Jack, mozzarella, and cheddar for your tortilla. And they're yummy. And they'll be coming to Portland in the Albertson Safeway um, later this spring. We just introduced them and they're selling like crazy in. Uh, the chains that we have. We have them in a couple chains down in Texas. Uh, in June, on June 6, 2020, we held the first World International Tempe Day. You know, Tempe was where I started, and that was my vision. And you can read about that in the book that I thought Tempe was going to be the next granola and it was going to have a whole section of the supermarkets. I was so psyched after I ate my first tempeh um, in Tennessee in 1977. And, you know, tempeh is so delicious when it's cooked right. Um, and I've been to Indonesia, which is the home of tempeh twice. Like this is a picture from Indonesia market where they still make the tempeh, they ferment it in banana leaves, which is really cool. Like eat all these little packs with a jungle string are all uh, tempeh and you'll see it even in the big grocery stores in banana leaves. And it is so yummy when you cook it right. Um, and we're, we were so, and we just had a Zoom call with all these tempeh makers on June 6th and tempeh researchers. And it was so successful that we've designated June 2021 uh, as International World Tempeh Month. And we're gonna have a tempeh conference and I'll be sure and let all you guys know about that. Um, this is a, a photo of a mock-up of a big tempeh plant that is going to be in Indiana that Greenleaf Foods, that's a part of Maple Leaf Foods, and they own Light Life and they own um, Field Roast both. And they're putting $100 million into this 100,000 square foot tempeh plant that'll 
employ 200 people. So this is pretty big news in Tempe. We've had to expand our own operation and uh, bigger incubators and bigger machinery to produce Tempe. So don't sleep on Tempe. Tempe is still going to make it. It's a great food. Um, I love the new, you know, Beyond Burgers and Impossible Burgers and stuff like that. But when you eat a Tempe burger or a Tempe sandwich, you just feel so good and so light and powerful and strong. So it's just a great food. I, I just love tempeh and have a lot of belief in it. So uh, here's what's happening in corporate America. You know, they are just seeing that there is money to be made in this plant-based food. So you have groups like Tyson launching plant-based meats. You got Sweet Earth that was an independent company was bought by Nestle. You've got Heinz with mean beans, uh, vegan beans. You've got Gardein now owned by ConAgra, one of the biggest meat companies in the world. And I actually eat these breakfast uh, sausage patties quite a lot, I love them. Um, then you have Happy Little Plants. What a funny name for Hormel, another big meat company uh, to call their vegetarian food. Cadbury, which I just used to love their chocolate, has a vegan chocolate. And then of course, you got Burger King and all these other fast food joints uh, doing it. So they're getting on board. And plant-based foods in total in the US last year was a $5 billion a year market. So these guys are buying up. And I'd much rather have them, you know, people go, well, they're meat companies, but I'd much rather have them wanting a piece of the action than being on the, the kind of guys that are trying to crush the vegan movement with these stupid labeling laws, you know, so, and these are the people that will ultimately succeed, you know, uh, and get on board as opposed to the other ones. Okay, so fast food chains add vegan items, you know, uh, one of the big fast food chains that you've seen a lot of was Beyond Meat and KFC. They have done, they've got this bucket and they got a green bucket. They've got some vegan chicken, which is great. But here's another story. This is uh, a friend of mine, Matthew Glover, who started uh, Veganuary and he stopped doing Veganuary to become an investor. He's on the board with me now of Veganuary, but this is him and his partner, Adam, and they have this product called VFC, Vegan Fried Chicken. And they brought it out in January for Veganuary, and it's just going crazy in uh, the UK. It's so good. He's sending me over a package next week. I can't wait to try it. But he's hoping to come to the United States uh, in the fall of next year with VFC. So watch out for VFC. But, you know, all of the fast food chains from Taco Bell to McDonald's, um, they're all jumping on board. So this has been a, a great thing uh, to see that happen. But KFC, um, KFC Canada actually has in all of their locations this kind of uh, green bucket of vegan chicken. But we're waiting for it down here. Veganuary, we were talking about, it's an amazing thing. You know, it, it asked people to um, try vegan for a month. It started in 2014 with a couple thousand people. Last year, there were 350,000 pledges in the world. This year, 580,000 pledges in the world in 2021. That's amazing growth. And in the US, there were 50,000 pledges. They've just started. I've been working with Wendy Matthews, who used to work at the Farm Sanctuary. And she's got, last year was her first year, and she got 50,000 US pledges. This year, she got 80,000. So in three or four more years, Veganuary, like in the UK, Veganuary is as big a retail event as Christmas. Um, in the retailers and they all have Veganuary coolers and um, specials and new products and everything. And there's so much excitement based around it. If you ever have a chance to go to London during January for Veganuary, you gotta see it. Uh, hotels are cheap there too, because it's pretty rainy, um, but um, 
it's a wonderfully run program and I can't wait to get it started in the US, which this year also had 100 participating brands. And it had this great piece in the Costco Connection magazine, um, which goes out to 15 million people. So yay for Veganuary. Uh, and Search of the Wild Tofurkey was released, uh, and, you know, and you can buy it on Amazon or wherever fine books are sold or maybe on one shelf near fine books, sort of fine books, but no, it was a fun story to write. It covers, it's mostly, it's not really a business book. There's some, about one eighth of it is business and seven eighths stories about me spending time. This is the farm down in Tennessee where Stephen, um was the leader and they were all they had 1600 hippies living there and when i visited them and found tempeh and they were all vegans but they didn't even use the word vegan they called themselves pure vegetarians and because vegan wasn't in the lexicon it had been invented but it hadn't been used popularly and they were doing cutting edge stuff it, they were really good people um, and it covers my days in the treehouse. This is my three-story treehouse. And uh, I didn't just live in treehouses. I lived in teepees and mouse urine infested trailers and just different places because I wasn't making a lot of money. I was pretty good at losing money for many years uh, up in Houston. And it also covers my days uh, selling tempeh to the Rajneesh. This is the biggest tempeh meal in his American history. And it was uh, right out there at Rancho Rosnish for a big guru festival they had in 1983. And they made sweet and sour tempeh for 10,000 people. So it's all in there, it's all in the book. And we're gonna give a book away here in just a minute. Um, here's a, a headline I love to see um, on the animal rights sort of thing, you know, China, permanently bans consumption of wild animals because there was this connection between bats and pangolins and these wild wet markets. And it's not just China, you know, this goes on in the US and all over Europe too. So uh, we just got to leave the animals alone and we got to get people to stop using super glue. I think they're using super glue on their eyelids as eyeshadow because they're keeping their eyes closed and uh, not seeing the suffering of animals. So we got to get them off of the super glue and use some other kind of good eyelid coloring. Um, so what do we look for in 2021? Here's my guesses of some of the products that we'll find coming out. Um, there'll be more vegan seafood, you know, vegan seafood's getting better and better. And, uh, you know, it's not just the land animals that suffer, but, you know, they say by 2050, some people say there won't even be fish left in the ocean. So uh, there'll be every kind of seafood from shrimp to scallops to salmon. And um, I can't wait for that day. But I think that more than that, I'm looking for steak and I'm surprised no one's done it. You know, like these are like whole muscle meats like uh, pork chops and uh, spare ribs and steak. So I think uh, we'll probably see some steak before the year's out. Um, on the Tofurky end of things, here's a sneak preview. We've got three flavors of cream cheese that are incredibly yummy too. We've got a plain and a strawberry and a garden vegetable one and, and they should be out um, this summer. And lastly, flavored tempeh. You know, there's nothing like good tempeh, but tempeh has always been sold in cakes and this is like pre-marinated flavored tempeh. There's some great tempeh snacks and different things that are being um, on the R&D tables of people now. And I really think tempeh is poised to make a big move in the years to come. So can plant-based foods become the dominant paradigm in our future, you may ask? Good question. And I've been just reflecting back in my life. I'm 69 years old uh, now. You never think you're going to be like that old, but voila, <laughs> here I am. And uh, I think of some of the things that I've seen come and go in my lifetime. One of the things is like pin boys. I'm, I'm not kidding. The first bowling alley I went to with my parents when I was like five or six, they had people uh, that were, these kids were setting up the pins. It wasn't automated yet, but 
you know, that was replaced by a more efficient system. Then when I was in junior high school, uh, I don't know if you know these, this is how, you know, you used to print stuff. You used to take out every little letter and space by hand and put it in there and line it up. It took me a whole semester in junior high industrial arts to get a, uh, a business card done, you know, something you could do in <clears throat> half a minute now. It took me six weeks to do then. So that was replaced, of course, by computers. Remember these? Film. How about film, the photo mat? You know, you'd take your film, you'd send it away and would come back two weeks later and you'd have like out of 12 photos, maybe you'd get two keepers and the rest were like black and like, oh man. So that was replaced by a phone that's like develops in your pocket. <clears throat> and then of course, there's the telephone, you know, and the dial-up telephone, but pay phones, you know, where you had to call up and you had to spend like, you know, $5 a minute or something crazy to talk long distance. And, you know, it's just an, another case. So all of these things are gone now. And, you know, it just makes me think that in the next 30 years, by 2050, it's going to be a very different situation. And I think plant-based foods by 2050 will be the dominant paradigm because after all, as Victor Hugo says, there's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come and our time has come, my friends. And we, I just can't wait to see it. So um, that's <clears throat> my behind the scenes talk, but I have one more uh, guess, and this is something that everybody can guess. This is a, another quiz, and this is for a, a book. And um, what I want you to do is in the chat, guess how, the answer to this question without going over. We're going to give this to the person that guesses closest to the number uh, without going over of the number of 100% vegan restaurants in Mexico City, according to uh, my research, which is, I won't tell you exactly where I get it right now, but I'll tell you in a minute. So pop it in the chat. John, read them off. There's two of them. One of them is, well, more than that, 100, 112, 34, 300, 15, 35, 100, 80, 600. Yeah, that it? Looks like it is. Somebody hit the nail right on the head. 80. Who said 80? Lisa. Lisa. Lisa, congratulations. Send me your address and I'll send you a book. I just think it's amazing. Here's my list. Every uh, February, I'm about ready to do this now. And by the way, um, I just read an article this afternoon that said, you know, you, you wonder about how COVID would affect restaurants. And Happy Cow says that more vegan restaurants were created in 2020 than had to close their doors because of COVID. Um, but here's the... Um, you know, you can see the rank. London has got the most vegan restaurants of any place in the world at 165. And Los Angeles, New York City, Portland down here at number 12. Um, but, you know, per capita, only Prague has more restaurants per capita, vegan restaurants per capita than Portland in cities over a million people. So that's imp pretty impressive. But I just think 80 is an amazing number because I traveled all over Mexico in the 70s and it was beans and rice, tortillas and guac and nothing against that. But these restaurants now are just top end and they have these luscious empanadas and, uh, you know, it's just a whole new worldwide game. It's, it's not just... Um, the US or England where this is happening, but it's it's all over the world. And, uh, you know, we sell product in places like um, Slovakia, down there in Chile, 
um, all over Europe, Spain, France. I mean, the world is, you know, New Zealand, all these crazy places, uh, Singapore, um, even Kuwait. Somebody, a friend of mine moved to Kuwait and she found tofurkey in the grocery store over there. So uh, we're seeing a worldwide thing. So anyways, um, maybe it went on longer than I thought, John, but uh, if anybody has any questions or things I want to talk about, um, I'm here. Let's let's chat. I, I have a question for you, Seth. Um, how many countries do you sell your products in? Oh, that's a good question. I would say um, that it's about probably two dozen, but I'll say this, the sun never sets on the Tofurky empire. <laughs> it's all, <laughs> yeah, it's all over the world. Yeah, but um, do you know what's another amazing thing about Mexico? Mexico is the country, you would never guess this, the country with the most, the biggest chain of vegan grocery stores is in Mexico. And it's this chain called Mr. Tofu. And they're all over. They have two or three in Mexico City. They're in Monterey. They're in Guadalajara. They're in um, just spread out all over Mexico. They're, they have 13, and they're adding two more this year to make it 15. That's the biggest chain of anything in the world. And everybody thinks like Germany is this vegan hotspot, and it is. And but they you know there was a company vegans that was talking about even coming to portland like five or six years ago uh and you know we sell to them but they had the idea the same idea that you know these kids that started this mr tofu chain down in mexico and they had 10 vegan stores all over germany but now they had to reduce it because they couldn't make it and uh there's only three and they're all in Berlin. Mm. And so here's Mexico with like 13 going on 15 uh, chain of vegan stores. And here's Berlin with only three. Amazing, huh? Yeah. Here's, here's another question. Is the fava bean the same as the fava bean? Uh, no, fava is like, um, it's a, it's a natural coagulant, and I believe it's from garbanzo beans, um, but it has the functionality in there. I should know that. Um, but um, fava bean is different. Let's see what it says for fava. Not the B and the V are right next to each other. So I typed in, it's hard to do it. Uh, oh, no, it is. You're right. It is from that. I'm, I'm mistaken. It is from the fava bean. Okay. Yep. All right. Next question. What, what's the threat to your business in the coming years? That's a great question. Um, you know, one of the threats, I'll tell you some of them. Um, it was not like, uh, we're not, uh, and especially me, you know, like it says on the book title, a business, I'm a business mythos, right? So I didn't sit there and go, hmm, where's the best place to make a tofurkey plant or a tempeh plant? Ah, Hood River. Hood River is a great place to live, but it's not you know, really this industrial place. And there's, we paid more for the one and a third acre that the Tofurky plant is on, on the waterfront. You know, I mean, we love being on the waterfront and it's beautiful and it's a great place to live. And that's what we cared about. But we paid more for that one and a third acre that we're on. And we don't have any room to expand now because we built as much as we can on that. Then we paid more than Amy's paid for 51 acres in Medford. <laughs> I mean, 
we're not the smartest, you know, business people like that. So that's one thing is, you know, how do we grow? And then two, the other thing about Hood River is we're becoming, you know, we're one of the bigger employers in town. And, um, you know, and when you have events like COVID, um, you know, and some people have to, like I was referencing, take care of their families and you need other people to substitute for them. It's not a huge labor pool. So we're pushing the limits of the labor pool, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, even like, like some of these bigger companies that are going in and they're buying up space, like, um, we used to be like one of the biggest companies and we're still a big company, but we're not like, uh, beyond meat and impossible. And those guys, or even like field roast and light life, they can, they have like, like, I think, um, uh, impossible has 200 R and D people in their lab. We have 220 approximately people in our whole plant that's workers that's management like our r&d plant has four uh team is four people and theirs is 200 so that's a threat um but like i say you know it's better because there's all this noise in the category from uh impossible and beyond and these new upstarts that have more money than god there's also room for us because it's easier for us to place our products in a category that's hot than when a category is cold and we've seen both over 41 years however you know uh sometimes these guys go in there and they just say i'll i'll pay you you know whatever uh a hundred thousand dollars if to kick tofurkey off the shelf and so we rely on um you know our brand and we survive by our instincts and um everything like that um and the other th threat actually is um a lot of the supermarkets now like kroger has their own brand i think it's called simple or simple truth or something you know where they want you to make product for them and you know, we just had a meeting with them this week and they said, you know, uh, we have our own brand, but we don't sell as good as Tofurky brand, but they still, um, you know, some of the stores, um, Whole Foods is like that too. Um, they're having more and more of their own brand. And um, so stores can be pretty obstinate about their own brand. And the own brands are usually cheaper, um, but they're, you know, because they're cheaper, a lot of times they're not as good. So I'm a big brand guy, actually. You know, I love uh, Field Roast brand. I like Light Life brand. I like Beyond brand. I like these brands, you know. <laughs> yep. So I don't know. There's some. Okay, here's the next question. Why has it been so hard to get Tofurky lunch meat lately? Uh, I don't know. Um, well, um, I'll tell you one thing, you know, and this is another thing about being where we are at the end of um, the year, uh, a car across the river from the plant, somebody random car fell off a cliff and uh, banged into this, the natural gas station for the whole mid Columbia Gorge, like Bingen White Salmon and Hood River, we were without um, natural gas for a week. Like we couldn't produce anything for a week. We, you know, this was right at the end of the year. So we, we were still catching up from that. That might be one reason, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, because what stores are you seeing the shortage in? Because we fill all the orders and we own 70% of the lunch meat a vegan lunch meat market and so we've been filling the orders but what store i wonder are they out on well i'll wait and see if they come back and tell us in the meantime here's another question uh, or this is a comment we love your products especially chicken keep it up oh. what's that and keep it up oh yeah chicken like this year um chicken just went off you know it, it had been a good seller and 
like ever since we yet it's been on the market for like five years i want to say and uh but this year it just went crazy i mean i and it's it's really gratifying to see but um i don't know why it, it suddenly took off but that's the way it happens sometimes, you know, who can understand the ways of the market. But thank you for that comment. That's a nice comment. I'm glad to hear it. But I just had some for dinner, actually, on a pizza. <laughs> My wife made uh, barbecue pizza with the barbecue chicken on it, and it was so good. Mwah. <laughs> okay, going back to the uh, grocery store, Fred Meyer is. Uh, oh, Fred Meyer, huh? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. They've been a longtime customer, and uh, you know, um, I will check into that. I'm going there tomorrow, up in the Dalles. I just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll see what I can see. I, I know from going to multiple different stores, there seems to be runs. A lot of times, there would be yeah. things, and it goes out. And yeah. Yeah, I think that is um, maybe one of the things is it, it is, there are definitely runs, um, you know, something, a good thing, like, you know, what was really, uh, we had a run on this year too, that was um, hard to predict is the Tofurky roast and the ham roast. They just flew out of the store. They don't have wings, but they flew out of the stores. And uh, we, uh, you know, like we, we start in June and we get all of these projections and then we, from the stores of how much they're going to sell. And then we pad the projections, you know, a certain amount because we don't want to be short. And that's worked for a long time. But man, this year, um, it just went off. And, uh, you know, then we buy all the stuff and start making them in September and then ship them in October. And, uh, but, there was just shortages big and i think some of it is there were just like whereas people were gathering you know maybe there'd be one tofurkey for a big gathering now they all had to be at home there was 12 gatherings or six gatherings and so they all had to have roast or something but i don't know but you know you uh you do the best job in forecasting but we've done a pretty good job you know we're really set up now for uh making the deli slices so we can, that's not, it's harder to make the roast because there are more components and uh, it's kind of a seasonal thing. We make roasts all year round, but it's a real seasonal push. So, but I'll have to check into that on uh, deli slices. I'm sorry to hear that. Next question. Will new seasons and chucks have uh, your cheese? Uh, don't know it just came out like literally last month and uh i think they you know new seasons the both of those stores have been really good about uh stocking our products so um we should have them well, into those stores i would think within the next year yes i would hope so we just i'm gonna make i'm making notes here and the uh, one of the other attendees said they just saw Muchu at New Seasons and look forward to trying it. Oh, really? It's at New Seasons now. Yeah, that's what it says. So. Oh boy, I love that. Okay, here's the next one. I love your products too. What is your favorite way to eat tempeh? I'm looking forward to the new options you'll be producing. What? Well. Uh, uh, one more comment. What? There's a ham roast too. <laughs> oh yeah, the ham roast is unbelievable. Uh, we've had that out for a couple of years now, and um, it comes in this casing that's um, looks like a honeycomb kind of casing. So it's beautiful when you take it out, and then you know you can go to tofurkey.com and you can see pictures of it. But there's a base that goes on it and oh my god the baste is just so yummy um so we do have that but uh as far as tempeh goes uh i have so many ways that i like to do it you know but if um i think you know having a, a tempeh lettuce and tomato sandwich 
is pretty hard to beat. You know, just get the smoky maple bacon tempeh and I fry it in a pan and put it on toast with veginets and tomato and lettuce. Uh, that's awful good. Although I also have a good um, tequila tempeh recipe where you uh, marinate tempeh in lime juice and tequila and um, garlic and chili. Oh man. And then you grill it on the grill and make like shish kebabs and you know all the alcohol blazes off on the grill but it just imparts this really je ne sais quoi flavor but i just love tempeh even like just taking a strip and cooking it i make my own tempeh at home too and i have access to our tempeh you know tempeh is one of those products that when you eat it fresh uh like right out of the pan right out of the incubator it's just unbelievable we, we like to make uh, uh, tempeh wraps too, so. Oh yeah. Okay, um, we are very lucky. Your products have been available for people to eat vegan. When I talk to people, your products have given recognition to eating vegan. Oh, nice. I That makes me feel good. I mean, that was, the whole idea, you know, the whole idea wasn't like you'll see in that book. It, it never really was to make money. And I, I just didn't know anything about business. You know, I was the last person you'd expect to be like a business person. And, uh, but I love tempeh and, you know, and I had also seen as a naturalist, um, the encroachment of farmlands onto wildlife habitat and everything. And I was like, boy, if, we could have a low on the food chain protein that was as delicious as this tempeh is, you know, it would make the world a better place. And that was my mission. And, you know, I think all vegan businesses have a mission at heart, really. And all the way from the stock market guys like Ethan Brown to the small little cookie maker at your local farm stand, you know, vegan cookies, you know, that's kind of our superpower is that there's uh, not just a money play, but there's this mission at the heart of all vegan businesses. So I think that keeps you in the game, even when the money's not there. And it wasn't there for a long time for me. <laughs> Here's another comment. We have chicken in the fridge at all times and brown rice cooked and ready so that it's a quick and easy to make whole bowl for lunch. We just love it. Oh, wow. That's a great idea. You know, I should do that too. Just have, I love, you know, brown rice. I love bowls, um, but that's, that's incredible. That sounds really good. You know, just chicken. Uh, you know, we have a barbecue flavor of the chicken, but my wife just gets the lightly seasoned one and throws it on the grill herself and grills it <clears throat> with some barbecue sauce and it's to die for. Okay, that looks like it's all the questions that have come. Great. Up. But it's a, I just want to really thank you. 